I would like to invite uh, Dr. Amir Farm Jnu, who is uh, uh, assistant professor there, and he has just published uh, another book on Brexit, and before that, he has also uh, published another book and ha has been a uh, very active uh, uh, academician, uh, contributing intellectually in uh, many fields, in uh, including on uh, Palestine. So I'm uh, these days I'm reading one of his good articles on on Palestine. So uh, formally, I would like uh, Dr. Ahmed to take over the chair and uh, please start the proceeding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, and uh, thank you to the Center for uh, the Study of Plural Societies for uh, inviting me. It is my privilege and my pleasure to chair this session. Uh, uh, Professor Jamil uh, Edin is, is someone who I have read and I have had the uh, opportunity of meeting virtually. Hopefully we will invite him to India um, one day, we were just talking about this. Uh, Professor J uh, Jamil Adin, uh, in his research, focuses on uh, modern Middle East history and modern Asian history. Through the uh, breathtaking sweep of his research, he brings out the international and intellectual histories of diverse empires such as the Ottoman and the, Jap and the Japanese. So it's quite a remarkable sweep, uh, geographically, intellectually, politically, socially, culturally, uh, his most recent book uh, is The Idea of the Muslim World, A Global Intellectual History, published by Harvard University Press in 2017. Uh, the book provides a broad understanding of the idea of pan-Islamism and the Ummah. Uh, Professor Aydin persu persuades us to rethink ideas such as pan-Islamism and how such an idea appeared in the late 19th century, um, uh, when large empires such as the British, the Russian, the Austro-Hungarian, and the Ottoman were the major players on the international stage. And then uh, he asks us to reconsider pan-Islamism when it re-emerges in the latter part of the 20th century, especially the 1980s onwards, and how it appears in the backdrop of the proliferation of nation states. So without further ado, I will now invite Professor Aydin um, to give his talk. Well, first of all, I would like to thank all of you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Omer Anas and uh, uh, Dr. Amir Ali, whose uh, book I uh, read and we, I'm very pleased that we also have a very similar approach. We agree on, on issues. so. I'm very pleased to be uh, talking to you today. Uh, what I think I should do is to maybe highlight a couple of the main arguments of the, the, the last book on the idea of the Muslim world and the Ummah and the previous one with regard to the main goal of this um, think tank about plural societies. And with regard to, <clears throat> also the, this is a connection with India with regard to the, the kind of crucial significance of South Asia and India for the Muslim intellectual history, as well as the global um, intellectual history. Um, of, of course, we live in a very uh, uh, complex world with uh, very uh, strong uh, ideological positions on history and history is over politicized. Um, uh, I was just uh, telling my students uh, we, we, uh, in the Ottoman history class, we covered the Battle of Ankara and how Tamerlane defeated the Ottomans. But we had a discussion with students on uh, Karina Kapoor and Saif Ali Khan uh, naming their son as Tamer, uh, Tam uh, Timur, Timur um, and, and the critique they received and how they, they responded. Um, just to want, want to make a point of, of that, uh, of course, history is with us today, even when you name your son or daughter, um, it, it is considered very political. And I want to start with, uh, with what I consider one of the, the saddest um, historical narratives that is also a distortion of history. And this historical narrative goes like this, that for various reasons, Muslims in Asia, but generally Asians, were not capable of um, creating sustainable, tolerant, plural societies. Um, that they have to learn this from Europe, which is the homeland of enlightenment. Um, and, um, and then, you know, some uh, Asians and Muslims learned, some couldn't, uh, but they are still struggling to uh, understand, internalize and apply the enlightened ideas of pluralism and, and tolerance. And, and as an example um, of this main argument, um, the, uh, the history of uh, the Ottoman Empire, the Mughal Empire, as well as the history of Hilafat movement, um, uh, uh, 
and pan-Islamism and the history of idea of Ummah is, is, is shown uh, as a proof uh, that this intellectual tradition is incapable of producing uh, tolerant and plural societies. Um, what I try to uh, show as a historian of the Ottoman Empire, as well as medieval empires, uh, and a historian of the 19th century, uh, is that actually the opposite is true. Uh, that in terms of practices of good governance, uh, respect for diversity and pluralism and tolerance, uh, both South Asia and the Ottoman lands have a lot to teach us. Um, uh, in, in fact, if you do an intellectual history going back uh, even before the 19th century, uh, let's say the 18th and 17th century, um, lands of, of South Asia uh, and the Ottomans were were examples of more tolerance compared to Europe. And there are, in fact, there are some, some intellectual historians who think that uh, John Locke, who wrote the essay on toleration, read a lot about the European travelers' observation on India. Um, as, for example, the Europeans uh, on, on the, around the time of enlightenment, 18th century, they read a lot about the observations on China to come up with the idea of a merit rather than aristocratic rule. Um, they also read a lot on, on how um, India was tolerant um, compared to Europe, that you could be any fate, um, there are no ghettos, you could be living in one city, um, and how tolerance is good for trade and prosperity. Um, and it, it, it seems that this, these observations kind of influenced the Enlightenment notions that the tolerance is a good thing, because Europe was more intolerant than other places. Of course, this tolerance in India or the Ottoman Empire uh, we call them the kind of uh, universal empire, the post-Islamic Mongolian universe. Muslim dynasty ruled post-Mongolian universal empire. These are Ottoman Safavids and, uh, and the Mughals. Uh, the tolerance they have might be different than our contemporary notions of citizenship, that they don't have notions of equality. I mean, these are societies that have slavery, they have concubines. There are a lot of things that we may not like uh, today, but they have some sort of a relative uh, inclusiveness compared to the practices, at least in Europe. But um, what, what I also saw uh, is an unfortunate distortion of history that we also have a very uh, inaccurate conception of what pan-Islamism, what Ummah meant in the, uh, both in, uh, in, in throughout history, but also in the 19th century. Um, uh, so the conception is that Muslims are just into creating an Islamic state throughout history. Um, and they were always uh, uh, into project of creating political unity among all Muslims from Muhammad all the way to the end of the Ottoman Caliphate, until nationalism. Um, and then you have this kind of a narrative of clash of civilizations. And these are ideas of clash of civilization uh, are, um, are very popular in American academia, especially after September 11, but even goes back a little bit earlier during in the Cold War. Um, someone like Bernard Lewis, who's very Islamophobic, uh, almost to the extent of a racist uh, scholar, who influenced uh, Sam Hunting's this notion of, of, uh, of pan-Islamism. But not only them, there are also Muslims themselves, especially after uh, the so-called the political Islam and Islamic revival. There is an interpretation of history that at least good Muslims will always try to create um, an Islamic unity at ex the expense of um, uh, Muslims living in some sort of plurality with uh, other societies. And if you pay attention, those um, uh, Islamic interpretations of the past actually get very disappointed with history. Uh, for example, Malik bin Nabi, who is an Algerian, uh, very good intellectual, Algerian intellectual, one time wrote uh, very harshly on Tamerlane saying that why did the, the Timurid Empire, Tamerlane, came and defeated the Ottomans in Ankara, Battle of Ankara, 1402, bothered the Ottomans, which he thinks delayed the Ottoman uh, conquest of Istanbul and conquest of Europe. If Tamerlane had left the Ottomans alone, the Ottomans would have uh, ruled uh, more territories in Europe and then prevented Europe's colonization of Asia and the Islamic world. So there's an history that he gets upset at Tamerlane 
we could have gotten upset at, at, at the, of course, at the Ottoman because it was the Ottoman Sultan who was rude in the letters. He, he didn't know that. Um, and, and when we look back, actually, it was this war uh, is a problem of the Ottomans. But nevertheless, uh, there is this um, obvious fact that throughout history, Muslim, there are more cases of Muslim empires and kingdoms fighting with each other. Uh, because they don't believe in this kind of a clash of civilization. Uh, these are empire builders. They're very proud Muslims. They also try to, um, whatever, however they come to power, how cruel they are, they're also trying to implement justice, a good rule. So we, we need to have a very complex understanding of these rulers, but they don't seem to be into a project of an Islamic unity. So that uh, Tamerlane came, defeated the Ottomans, but he, throughout his life, he actually fought more Muslim rulers only one time he fought against crusaders, um, Templars in, in Smyrna, Izmir, and he brags about this, but then you say, Mr. Tamerlane, 99 other times you fought other, against other Muslims, right? Only one time you fought against Christians, that he's really uh, proud of himself. But that question would have been meaningless for him because he's into uh, a building of an empire. Um, so what, um, and there are more cases of uh, like that to contemporary Muslims are reflecting on the past and, and understanding why there was no Muslim unity in history. I mean, you can talk about the Nader Shah, who is responsible for basically the collapse of the Mughal Empire before the Europeans East India Company, right? If he didn't come, and Sanjay Subramanian has a very good article on this, you know, after he defeated the Mughals, uh, the Persian King Nader Shah, he could have even stayed in India. That would have made India united and stronger, but he looted and went back. Um, and, and uh, Ali Shariati, uh, Iranian intellectual, also wrote that the Safavids um, was wrong in bothering the Ottomans. They're still always privileging the Ottomans as this Muslim uh, empire with the caliphate, fi always fighting with the Europeans. But when we look at the reality, of course, throughout history, there was no such thing of a political unity among Muslims. Um, uni the political decisions were very pragmatic. Um, in fact, only the Ottomans and, and maybe around the Mediterranean, uh, Muslims uh, have this clashes, wars with the European Christians. But majority of the Muslims actually lived to the east of Arabia in, in Indian Ocean. And Indian Ocean, they lived together with Hindus and Buddhists. And, and, uh, and there were Christians, but uh, you know, the clash with the Christianity was not the main um, story, the main experience of those people. So we, we can perhaps say that since the time of the early caliphs, there was never a, a kind of an Islamic unity. Even the Abbasid empire was not the only empire. At some point, there were three different caliphates, one Shia caliphate. Uh, and uh, I counted uh, this, uh, about up to 100 different Muslim dynasties um, in history. Then we get to the 19th century. Uh, they say, okay, maybe these Muslims were not good Muslims, that they were, they haven't done their duties. But that's also not true. You know, we can't say that the Muslims in 16th, 17th century didn't understand Islam. They were practicing their religion. They were trying to be just and fair. Whatever they understood from religion, they, they tried to practice it. But once we get to the 19th century, we see something very unique happening in the sense that only in the 19th century, we see a movement for uh, intellectually, but also politically, to think about Ummah as a global community um, and think about some sort of a polit political solidarity in that Ummah. Um, and this happens uh, because of multiple reasons. One of them is, of course, the technological revolution of the steamships, telegraph, and the train. So there's more interconnectivity among Muslims. Um, Ironically, the, uh, our colleague, uh, famous Indian Muslim intellectual uh, scholar Seema Alevi wrote a very good book on this, on um, cosmopolitanism in the age of empire. Um, and she shows that actually, ironically, the British uh, empire built the infrastructure and the grid uh, without in intending it for some sort of greater Muslim connectivity. And that's why the number of pilgrims going to Mecca increased 10 times or, or even 20 times in the 19th century. But there's also a second reason that um, it was the European colonial racism that categorized Muslims uh, almost like a race, uh, a race racialization through religion, a global community. And if it was done initially by um, empires like British, which uh, 
which experimented with different contexts. Uh, at some point, they actually called Indians brown race, whether they're Hindu or a Muslim. Uh, but then they moved from the brown race to separate the Hindus and Muslims and to focus on the Muslims uh, as an inferior, from their perspective, from perspective of Christianity, as an inferior global community. And a third step is that in response to this European racialization, which, as you know, in India or in um, or the Arab lands, that means that you are a second or a third class citizen, that the racialization is, is also a rejection for your claim for equality. Um, as a response to that, then Muslim intellectuals created a, a kind of a Muslim enlightenment in the 19th century, relying on the reinterpretation of Islamic text, uh, but also uh, celebrating this global moment of connectivity and uh, offering a solidarity to defeat European racism. This solidarity of Muslims from Sayyid Ahmed Khan to Muhammad Iqbal, and, and, uh, to, uh, which includes uh, Jamalatin Afghani, Abdu, um, uh, but also Namak Kemal, um, all the Turkish intellectuals, um, Shibli Numani, the, the kind of oligarch generation and the post oligarch generation, which is a corresponding um, intellectuals like in Turkey, uh, young Ottomans to young Turks. Um, and in the Arab world, the Nahda generation. Uh, this generation is very crucial because they are the ones who retold Islamic intellectual tradition, reinterpreted according to the needs of the time in an anti-racist, globalist, pro-enlightenment politics, um, and created the modern narratives of, of Muslim identity and history. So they are they basically created a new code, almost moving from old uh, computer codes to uh, well, the Windows. Uh, but the, you know, the elder people will know that before 1996 or seven, our computers were, were, were in a different operation system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like the, this uh, late 19th century Muslims rewrite a new operation system for the uh, for Muslim intellectual history, right? That, that they are the ones that are very foundational. Um, so in some ways, uh, this shows that the, the narrative we have the simplistic narrative we have is that there was an ummah politically united, um, that the Europeans came and divided us, is not fully accurate. Uh, it may actually, initially it was the opposite, right? The Muslims were always divided into different empires, but the European empires came and their racism caused a unity, a division for a unity of the ummah. But this was also initially not anti-imperialist, that it was uh, initially uh, for uh, reforming the empire. So if you think about Sayyid Ahmed Khan, um, he is critical of uh, Christian, Christ, missionary Christianity. Uh, he is critical of European Orientalism. And that's true for uh, Muhammad Abduh Jamal Tin Afghani. But, but he's not clear on what kind of a political system it will come, right? He, he said he prefers, is, if you look at his debate with uh, uh, William Hunter, um, that he prefers uh, an equality within empire, equality of Hindus, Muslims, and Christians, uh, rather than eliminating the empire. So, I mean, because the history of the world is the history of empire, so that people are not there in terms of imagining a national separation. And I think that is um, this period of uh, William Hunter's 1870 to uh, 1920, uh, what I call the golden age of Pan-Islamism is the, it's the Ummah, the modern Ummah Muslim world first um, uh, classical period because before 1870s, we don't have much of a call for uh, a, a shared narrative of history and, a, and an intellectual solidarity among Muslims. This also created something very unexpected, um, a, a much stronger robust link between the Ottoman Empire and South Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, I mean, th these empires, of course, had connections and people knew each other's books. There's a circulation of uh, madrasa curriculum. There's tra always travel to, to Mecca. But the connection between the Ottomans and the South Asians, um, both Muslim and Hindi, I I I Hindus, uh, increased tremendously after 1870s and 1880s. And given the fact that Ottomans never ruled over South Asia, but this is a, is a land of a different empire. And that leads to the question of uh, Khilafat movement and the Indian Muslims interest in the caliphate. Um, so the wrong interpretations uh, was that this was a reactionary Muslim conservatism. 
but the Muslims always believed in the caliphate and against the European uh, modernity, they hold on to their own ideas. And, and then um, Ottomans were the, the symbol of an Islamic resistance. So there's this romanticization of Abdul Hamid. There's even a kind of a movie called uh, Paytacht Abdul Hamid, where Abdul Hamid appears like an anti-imperialist figure in the palace, the Che Guevara of the late 19th century, always thinking about the Ummah, and he's trying to provoke um, Indian Muslims to revolt against the British. Um, which never happened, right? That's, uh, that he never actually asked Indian Muslims to provoke. Because Abdul Hamid, uh, uh, he wants, uh, his main job is to preserve the Ottoman Empire. And he's thinking about his relationship with Greek and Armenians. Um, he's a Muslim ruler, but he rules over um, non-Muslims, Jews as well. Um, and he, you know, Ottoman Empire has a, has a citizenship law in 1869, which says that everybody is equal citizens. Uh, and it's a very reformist. Um, instead of seeing this as a reactionary solidarity against the West, um, I and many other colleagues uh, argued that this late 19th century call for Muslim solidarity is also called for a reformed, pluralist, anti-racist empire and a call for Muslim enlightenment. Um, and, and so we have to be very comfortable to actually in the first uh, golden age of uh, Islamic internationalism, 1872, the 1920s, uh, see this period um, uh, as a revival of a kind of Muslim cosmopolitanism, uh, a, a project of, of, of a pluralism of a new empire, whether Muslims living under British, French, or Dutch rule, or where, whether they have their own political rule. So if you look at the content of that intellectual solidarity, we don't see a kind of a fundamental, we don't see any sign of a fundamentalist reaction to modernity. Uh, uh, for example, look at why Abdul Hamid or the Ottomans are celebrated among Indian Muslims, that they abolished discriminatory, discriminatory taxes, jizya. If you look at Shibli Numani's visit to Istanbul, for example, he praises uh, Fatma Ali Hanum, uh, kind of a, a Muslim feminist, whose father codified the Islamic personal law in Majalla, which is a very modern progressive legal uh, reform. Uh, and, and in fact, Fatma Ali Hanum's uh, uh, Muslim feminist text was translated into Arabic and Urdu. I think um, Shibli Numani has something to do with it, uh, her, uh, his recommendation. The, the Ottomans never, uh, during that process, uh, did not impose uh, the discriminatory aspects of the Sharia on non-Muslims. The jizya was abolished. And there's no debate on, uh, on the abolishment of jizya. Once it's gone, it's gone. Nobody wants to bring it back. But there's no, uh, you know, this, this, this story about the uh, Islamic State in Iraq where they were bothering the Yazidis, which is horrible, right? I mean, but the thing is, the Yazidis were there for 1,300 years. Nobody bothered them. And in the 19th century, they became equal citizens like Jews and Christians in Iraq after re reforming Ottoman Empire. And that's exactly the things that uh, Indian Muslims are admiring in the Ottomans. They are admiring this uh, Muslim reformism and uh, Muslim cosmopolitanism, which because it, it, it actually proves the Orientalist racism that the Muslims are not modern, that they cannot be progressive and rational. When uh, Indian Muslims are visiting Istanbul, they say, look, this city is like a European city. Um, they have very enlightened rulers and enlightened ru uh, rule. And I don't mean to romanticize this, but we need to understand why pan-Islamism and the Ummah is not uh, a call uh, of rejection of enlightenment and modernity, but in fact, it's an affirmation of that. Um, Abdul Hamid, uh, even though he's the caliph, uh, which is also good for the protection of the holy cities, he has a lot of respect because he's, he's a protector of not only Mecca, Medina, but also Jerusalem and Najaf for the Shia. So Indian uh, Shia Muslims also respect him as a kind of protector of the holy sites of, of India, of Iraq, sorry. Um, but he's, uh, his modernity is also symbolized by his reference to his Khan titles. The Khan title is important. All the Indian actors have that title, Khan, but Khan also represents that there, uh, there is an imperial art of imperial governance of pluralism, cosmopolitanism that is inherited from the Mongolians and, uh, and post-Mongolian empires uh, because it's a sovereign title. Caliphate is more of a spiritual title. Caliphate does not have any indication of a sovereignty in their mind. 
Um, what is, for example, celebrated is the railway that connects Damascus to Mecca. Railway, one third of which are, are funded by Indian Muslims, but those Indian Muslims were equally loyal to the British Empire. So they have this notion of double loyalty, right? That's spiritually caliph, uh, politically the queen. Um, so I call this kind of harmony between caliph and the queen, the, the, the idea of, of an international order based on peace and, and cosmopolitanism. So the celebration of the Ummah and the Caliphate is actually a, a celebration of this Muslim modernity and it's, it's the peak of Muslim modernism. And you can, I mean, Indian, Indian intellectual history is full of examples of this, right? The, from Sayyid Ahmed Khan to uh, Muhammad Iqbal. Um, so why, what do Ottomans gain out of it? The, what the Ottomans gain out of it is this, is that um, they are pleasantly surprised how much attention and respect they received. Um, they are uh, also uh, setting a good example to the rest of the Muslims when the Ottomans reformed, abolished slavery. Uh, it's a very important with, uh, kind of, if the Caliph is abolition slavery, uh, then it sets a good example to other Muslims. Um, opening modern schools like Istanbul University, for example, had, um, it became a model for uh, Hyderabad's Osmania University. Um, uh, they had uh, female students without any debate entering the classes with men. This is, you know, there's no segregation. Uh, those students, you know, they're, they're modestly dressed, but nobody says, oh, the woman shouldn't be in the classroom, they should be in the back. I mean, it's very hard. Uh, I guess in India, you are in a cosmopolitan culture. Um, but for American students, it's really hard to teach this topic because the moment they hear Islam, Caliphate and the Sharia, their mind goes to uh, Iraq and, and Afghanistan. And uh, there is no similarity and a connection between the late Ottoman or late uh, late 19th century Indian intellectuals and uh, Taliban uh, or Iraq, right? I mean, these, there, there's a, another hundred years, we need to understand how the kind of ideas of Taliban and Islamic State came, but they're more related to the Cold War um, ideological battles and how Islam being reinterpreted in that context. Um, but for the Ottomans, this is very important because they want, because of their military weakness towards Russia, they first want an alliance with England. And they want to use England's uh, status as the greatest Muslim empire in the world. And their status as a caliphate to argue for a special relationship between the Ottoman Empire and the British. Uh, and that's uh, from which the Ottomans greatly benefited in the Crimean War when the Russia attacked England and friends went there to defend the Ottomans. So it's like an anti-clash of civilizations. Because of that, by the way, it's a, uh, uh, it's a shameful moment in uh, Ottoman history that in 1857, uh, when uh, uh, Indians revolted against colonialism, uh, Ottomans supported the British. So there's some sort of, from Ottoman perspective, you know, British Empire is their friend and an ally, uh, and they have a right to rule. And as, as the Ottomans have a right to rule over Christians, most uh, British has a right to rule over uh, uh, Hindus and Muslims, so they didn't see a problem. Um, the, fast forward, and uh, there, there was something similar in, in Algerian War of Independence, modern Turkish Republic uh, from uh, 1954 all the way to 1960 actually supported France and the United Nations um, against Algerian claims. And actually in one of the votes at the United Nations, Turkey's vote was very crucial. It actually broke the tie, um, the delayed the uh, uh, Algerian claims at the United Nations. So the, all the Turkish leaders apologize whenever go to Algeria that they supported France in the early parts of the war. They should similarly apologize for, uh, there's no connection with the Ottomans that in 1857, they did support the British and if they wanted to apologize more. Um, but, um, but from the Ottoman perspective, this assertion of pan-Islamism is not a, a call for a jihad against the West or a clash of civilization. It, it's actually, on the contrary, they are trying to create a peaceful international order among empires. And they think of Ummah, given that the Muslims are in the France and in the India and Philippine and the British, Ummah is kind of a glue to connect different empires peacefully, not in, in a clash. So Abdulhamid never, Abdulhamid never asked um, any Muslims to revolt against European empires. He, his, his basic line is that if you give Muslims their rights and nice, then I will encourage them to be loyal to you. And that's 
you know, they, even Americans did that. When America uh, invaded Philippines and Muslims were revolting against them, Americans sent an ambassador, uh, a, a diplomat to Abdulhamid, ask Abdulhamid's help. And Abdulhamid has no connection with Filipino Muslims at that time. But he said, look, of course they shouldn't fight. If you're nice to them, they should also, you know, be obedient to you. So he, they, he said something nice. And American diplomats really got excited that they got the support of the caliph. Um, but they are also imagining an ummah where Istanbul is at the center and, and the kind of Ottomans are diplomatically using that, that, that idea. Um, so th there are three sides of the British, Indian Muslims and the Ottomans in that triangle to, of pan-Islamism. And they all have somehow different interpretations. The early British uh, empire also thought that their friendship with the Ottoman Caliph will give them extra legitimacy. Uh, to rule over Indian Muslims, something which they regretted later on. They thought that, uh, well, we don't need the Ottoman Sultan to rule over India. Who is, who is he there to interfere in us? So on the way to World War I, this position will change, or perhaps after a Gladstone's Islamophobic hatred of Muslims. But in early um, British Empire, there is this idea that the queen is a friend of the Caliph, and that's why the Indian Muslims should be loyal. Um, to, to the British Empire. But I do uh, want to uh, want us to think about the, uh, the, uh, the globalist, internationalist, anti-racist aspects of this pan-Islamic idea. So uh, the, the, in the global intellectual history, uh, the assumption is that all the good ideas, global ideas comes from Europe. That the, non, the role of the non-European is to emulate, copy, um, accept, so, you know, everything Gandhi and Ataturk or um, whoever is in China, the only thing they do is to read the script, you either accept the European values or not. But here we see that actually the, 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 in the global intellectual history, there is a moment from 1870s to 1910s where intra-Muslim conversations, but also intra-Asian conversations are very important to articulate some of the wrongs. One of which is clearly anti-racism that it's the Muslims and the Hindus and the Japanese and the Chinese who were telling Europeans that racial discrimination um, is violating the principle of enlightenment and equality. And they are the ones who will win eventually. Uh, but the Europeans are have this kind of cunning historical narrative is that now they make it sound like, oh, we taught them that the racial equality is a good thing. So even if we, uh, we we violate it, but the ideas always come from us, which I think is not, is, is not true. Um, similarly, we, we have to also think about this excitement about Muslim connectivity, Ummah, intellectual uh, exchanges, this Muslims going to pilgrimage to Mecca, connecting, uh, celebrating the humanities diversity. It goes all the way to Malcolm X's trip to Mecca as a form of norm, global norm production, uh, celebration of pluralism that comes from the Muslim experience uh, or an Indian Muslim experience um, uh, that includes Hindus too. So you know that Gandhi was also supporting the Indian Muslim claim for the for the caliphate. Um, so these are um, the, the early part of the book that I, I try to discuss um, how um, the calls for solidarity of the Ummah is actually called for self-determination, racial equality, sovereignty. Then in the second half, I try to talk about how with decolonization, um, uh, how this, this uh, uh, balance is kind of uh, undone with World War I and World War II, uh, all the illusions, kind of both racial illusions, but also some of the illusions that the Ottoman young Turks had to think that they can use this idea of Ummah and the pan-Islamism to provoke revolt in India against the British, which they knew that it would not have worked. Um, so because of the, the kind of Islamophobia, as well as the crisis of the international order, Ottoman own uh, internal problems with the Armenians and the Greeks in World War I, they sided with Germany um, and declared uh, jihad. I, I mean, jihad is misunderstood. There is some sort of internationalist element to it. Um, misunderstood in the sense that part of it is, is sheer stupidity to ask the Muslims in Fran French empire or the British empire to revolt. No, but no, I mean, no Muslim poor individual is gonna revolt against their ruler. And, and actually Abdul Hamid himself, when he, he was by then deposed by the young Turks and he was living in a palace uh, just across the water in Anatolian side. 
um, his uh, his brother was a sultan. And he, when he heard about this, he was really furious. He said, look, these young people don't know how these things work. You cannot declare jihad. Um, this idea of, of uh, he said, this idea of a pan-Islam, uh, he said, I created it. You know, they don't know how to interpret this. He said, it has a name, uh, but it's, the ismiwar jismiyok. He says, it has a name, but it doesn't have a body. I mean, he's right. There's no international organizations to regulate this Muslim solidarity. But he's also very aware that Muslims in different empires initially are loyal to these empires. Um, and uh, true World War One. I, I mean, there is an element of this jihad, of course, this misunderstood element is that the young Turks themselves are actually don't want an expansion of the Ottoman Empire everywhere. They're very respectful of sovereignty. Um, in fact, at that point, Iran is very weak, but they always defended Iran's national sovereignty. Uh, so their call for jihad is also called for uh, uh, national self-determination, even before Woodrow Wilson. But nevertheless, the World War One becomes a turning point for multiple reasons. I think uh, the, the crucial story for Indian Muslims and Hindus is that Britain uh, gained the loyalty of Indian Muslims um, in return for promises that they will respect the caliphate, spiritual sovereignty, and holy cities in Arabia, which included Jerusalem for, uh, from the perspective of Indian Muslims. So the Balfour Declaration became a kind of a betrayal of Indian Muslims by the British by uh, giving or promising an, a sacred site or, or an Arabian site to, uh, uh, to the Jewish world. It's a kind of Zionism. But it's a contradictory, right? The greatest re representative of the Muslim world, the British Empire, which ruled over 40% of all Muslims, gave a Muslim majority Palestine to the Jewish world. There's some sort of uh, both Islamophobia and anti Semitism are intersecting in that moment, which is the turning point for the legitimacy of the British Empire. Um, but with nationalism um, and you know, the Ottoman defeat and the Turkish War of Independence, which was successful um, partly. Uh, Indian support. Uh, it's very clear that without the support of the Indian Muslims and Hindus during the Khilafat movement, Turkish nationalists wouldn't have been that powerful in renegotiating the Lausanne Treaty. Um, and the financial support was very important too that uh, Omer knows that, but the, the first uh, and still one of the biggest banks in Turkey, uh, Ishbank, so was built by the leftover money from the Indian Muslims. Um, the money was left in Os uh, Ottoman Bank and uh, Ataturk decided that instead of, you know, where, where can you return the bank of money? So he's, instead of returning the money to India, um, just build the first bank there, which is, I think, is worth $10 billion. So, Omar, you should organize to ask the money back. Um, you should <laughs> get at probably $2 million from the Indian Muslim. Um, um, so, the rest of the story, I, mean, I will cut it very short, is that. I think this golden age ended by uh, World War I and World War II in realization that the empires wouldn't survive. It has its own contradictions. And with nationalism, Ummah was divided. So I think the, the peak when Muslims were never fighting with each other was from 1870s to 1914. And then nationalism uh, ironically liberated Muslim from European rule, but also divided them into uh, national borders. And, and it somehow, uh, this was a success that right? people gained their uh, independence and dignity. Um, and, and there's a sense of Muslim internationalism intersecting with Asian third world internationalism that, that appears in Bandung. Um, so India, Pakistan are together in Bandung um, with Indonesia to think about Asia and the Islamic world together to remake the new world, um, which is post-imperial, uh, uh, post-racist. Um, but in that process, of course, the greatest casualty of this process of Orientalism, racism, and the struggle is the partition, uh, not only India, but also multiple partitions, that is, uh, partitions of Turkey, uh, the Greeks are gone. So the Turkish Greek partition is the first, uh, one of the major partitions. Um, Armenians are expelled, and Indian Muslims are very torn. On the one hand, they sympathize with the suffering of the Armenians, but they also don't want to... Um, um, betrayed the Turks. Um, and I think with, with these partitions, uh, nationalism, somehow there's this Muslim internationalism entered the new stage. Um, so the biggest question is that when did Pan-Islam uh, came back? And I think this is the late Cold War. Uh, it has something to do with the Saudi-Egyptian competition. 
King Faisal's initiatives to create a new Muslim internationalism, eventually with the Iranian revolution, uh, the new Muslim internationalism came back, but it's very different than the first one. Um, it has a lot of um, socialist uh, ideas in it. It has a lot of American anti-socialist propaganda in it. So they kind of mix both in the Cold War to think that when Cold War groups failed, Islamic internationalism will be the last utopia, the idea of a, the idea of a third way. Um, and, but it's very different than the first pan-Islam because first pan-Islam is cosmopolitan, very imperial, very pluralist. Second pan-Islam is, is based on majoritarian nationalism. It has this ideological rigidity of imposing Sharia. And the fault is not necessarily the revival of Islam. Uh, is that the second pan-Islam is not necessarily more pious than the first one. It's just that in the intervening period, modern idea of nationalism, majoritarian uh, nationalism, and the state becomes so important. So the uh, post humani generation kind of internalized the modern majoritarian nationalism, made it Islamic, and created the kind of Frankenstein that we are still dealing with, this kind of idea of an Islamic fundamentalism that will come later. But these are, you know, mostly also a part of the European inter imperial interventions and the Iraq war and the violence. Um, so in the conclusion, I wanna say that we need a new intellectual history, new global history uh, that, uh, that kind of is careful about the context and the nuance and not be deceived by the textualism that people say, I say this because it was always part of Islam. It's just like, when, where, how did you interpret this verse in this way? Uh, and, and then also recover the kind of lost futures and the lost internationalism or uh, erased internationalism of Muslims and Asians in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, I will stop here and wait uh, for your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ed. It was a fascinating talk. Uh, it's fascinating because the, um, the, what global intellectual history does is that it opens up the limitations of categorizations uh, and compartmentalizations like South Asia. And I think this has a kind of very restrictive kind of uh, effect on our understanding. Just to give you a simple example, I mean, 1857 in India, we talk about as the Great Mutiny. Uh, just four years earlier, you talk about the, the Crimean War and you know the, 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 the British, the, the Ottoman Empire and the, and the help that the British Empire gave. So I think uh, the idea of South Asia and this kind of categorization and compartmentalization needs to be questioned. I often feel that this is done because of the imperatives of, especially American university area studies programs, a point that Edward Said makes in his book, Orientalism, saying that this is the new, the American version of Orientalism, the US version, is yeah. in terms of area studies programs compared to British and French, which is more in terms of linguistics and philology. My second point is about the enlightenment, which I found very interesting. Uh, what that does is that it, at least when I was listening to you, uh, it made me think about the shadow that the, uh, the Ottoman Empire cast on Europe, Hungary, and especially into England. Because yeah. one of the things that I have been very interested in is the English Enlightenment. And the strand of the English Enlightenment, which was very favorable to Islam in terms of Islam's uh, uh, very emphatic monotheism. It, you know, there was kind of a dissent against the, the Trinitarianism of, of the Church of England. Uh, to such an extent that Christians who favored this kind of, of, of you know, who were open to this kind of Islam, would often be accused of turning Turk, being yeah. too sympathetic to Islam and too sympathetic towards uh, Turkey. So uh, you talked about John Locke, uh, and I think the, 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 the version of the Quran that John Locke uh, had in his library and which he may have read would have been Alexander Ross's translation. Ah, yes. Not a great translation, but the, the 1734 translation by George Sale, on which a book by Ziauddin Elman Safi has been written called The Enlightenment Quran. Uh, brings in you know, the strands that went into understanding Islam and the Quran as a text and an enlight enlightened text. Um, and I think I would completely agree with you on this point that there is a need to rethink the enlightenment, not the mainstream 18th century enlightenment, but to step back perhaps into the 17th century and look at those shadow lands of the enlightenment where there are other alternative enlightenments where remarkably Islam and Christianity are you know, in in engaged in this great collaborative enterprise where they're not yeah. enemies, and this is actually the point of your, you know, your, your whole intellectual history, that it's not always daggers drawn for, for, for Islam mm -hmm. and, 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 and Christianity. Uh, this brings me to the point about Islamophobia, and um, it's interesting in the UK, a country that I look at, and in fact, my book on Brexit is just out, which, you, which Omar talked about. Um, it's interesting that Islamophobia is denied because it is denied that Muslims are a racial category. 
whereas it is precisely the racialization of Muslims yeah. that has resulted in Islamophobia. Uh, interestingly, Boris Johnson, the, the British Prime Minister, has roots, uh, ancestral roots in Turkey. Yeah. His grandfather, Ali Kamal, his great grandfather, was, was an uh, official of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, he doesn't seem to want to remember that too much. Um, but lastly, uh, I do want to quickly touch upon the nation state. Uh, this is my last point. And I think that the whole question of Islamophobia is refracted through the prism of the nation state. Uh, when you look at, let's say, something like anti Semitism, uh, anti Semitism arose because of the lack of, perceived lack of assimilability of yeah. Jews between nation states. When it comes to Muslims, I think it happens because of this perception of a lack of loyalty of Muslims within nation states. So I think yeah. when I when I try to understand anti-Semitism and, and Islamophobia uh, as, as forms of hatred, the distinction, I mean, the, the, the common factor seems to be the nation state. But when it comes to the Jews, there's a kind of an unassimilable position of the Jews between nation states. With Muslims, the problem arises in terms of how they locate themselves within the nation state. Uh, I have one uh, curious question in my mind I would like to share with you. It is about political, uh, maybe it is related to political theory. Uh, but in, in the late Ottoman Empire, we, we saw some uh, reimagining uh, process of the Ottoman Empire, and they were talking about uh, the Ottoman button, which you have also men mentioned. Uh, for example, uh, the paper of uh, Benu Lozkan, uh, he has uh, given the detail of, uh, and especially uh, the, uh, the, the minority, uh, minority the Ottoman Empire, Empire, they were more focusing on these aspects of uh, reimagining the uh, weapon. And the similar uh, examples, I think that we had seen, but very shortly uh, in the Mughal Empire as well. And we have some references like Mughal weapon, uh, which was uh, for a united India, secular India, and, and a constitutional monarchy or um, without a monarchy, maybe. So how do you see these efforts at that time for empires, whether they were just a tactics of uh, uh, survival for these empires, or they could be seen as genuine uh, counter uh, to nation state processes? Uh, thank you, Omar. I, I think this is, this is a, a very important question in the transition from the age of empires to the age of nationalism. Uh, of course, we need to note that in the late 19th, early 20th century, people did not predict that the empires will collapse or end. Uh, nationalism comes very late, uh, and it only becomes a kind of only option. Um, and there is some sort of a mu uh, multiple scenes and theaters which are interconnected for Muslims, right? So the Ottoman Empire is trying to keep this um, uh, multi-religious empire in Anatolia and the Balkans. They have problems in, in the Balkans most with the Greeks and Macedonians, uh, which Indian Muslims are all closely following. They know a lot about the Balkans. And then Anatolian Armenians. But the Ottomans are very strong in Arabia, that Arab Christians are, are embracing Ottomanism, Arab Jews as well. So actually the Ottoman Empire was strongest and healthiest um, in the Arab provinces. Um, but then with World War I, once the empire collapsed and the Arab provinces then get colonized by Europe, it, it's, it's a very, I mean, when you think about it, there's, there's also the kind of contingent factor that the, if the Ottoman elites did uh, avoided World War I, there would have been a very different political imagination. I wouldn't mean to say it would be better or worse, but World War I changed any, everything, a, a kind of defeat. And once you have this kind of move from the, cosmopolitan imperial Watan based on equal citizenship of diverse plural societies to the majoritarian Watan, that's kind of mostly Turkish Muslim Watan. That transition happened 10, 15 years. I think the meaning of Watan changes too. Um, but but the, the tragic uh, end of the story is that once Turkey fails in preserving, and since your think tank is about plural societies, a plural notion of citizenship, um, by failure, I guess by internal failure, uh, by imperialism, by World War One, uh, I, I, I mean, and, and we should think that the Arab provinces was the most successful pluralist model of citizenship. That they they actually didn't want to leave the Ottoman Empire; they were just colonized by Europe. Then it it becomes a kind of a 
example for Indian Muslims. I mean, and, and as well as the partition of uh, Zionism uh, and Palestine. Um, and then the, the partition happens. So then this option of plural cosmopolitan societies are, are taken out of kind of possibility and is seen as a problem. And nationalism, majoritarianism seen as a cure. But I, I argue that that cure, that, that medicine is also a poisonous uh, medicine, that it wasn't a good solution, right? That it, you, you destroy the plural fabric of the society. Um, and then there is definitely then the Watan is redefined. Redefined multiple times in Turkey uh, from even in, in, in the Lausanne uh, period, uh, Turkey was more of a Muslim nationalist. The Kurds were considered an essential part of Turkey. Arabs still wanted to come as a federation but fast forward in the 30s, Turkish nationalists then began to even exclude Kurds in, in, in that definition. So it's in that context, I think there's a question by, by Noor Mohammed. Halide Edip goes to India. Um, and to, you know, and then I'm very, I was very impressed how Indian intellectuals, including Nehru, uh, it's at Jawara Nehru University, he really liked Halide Edip and wanted to hear from Halide Edip what the Turkish experience was and what lessons it can offer. And I think we have a person from Jamia Milia, uh, I think that was the host of the place. These are very well attended lectures. Uh, it could be a, still a good MA thesis and, and studies. Uh, and I, I think that in that conversation, there's something ironic in the, I, I will find that, you know, Indians, it shows that Indians are following the Turkish experience as a model for themselves. But the Turkish experience might also give them some sort of bad ideas, right? The, the, the one bad idea is that pluralism didn't work. The Ottoman Empire failed. It's better to move the populations and create homogenous nation states. I'm not sure how they, I mean, how they is, is actually in exile at that point. Um, he's not clearly saying that, but he, there are some sort of implications of that. And I think we also need to think about the tragedy of that transition that we thought pluralist model didn't function very well and they needed to create homogenous societies, which then created a new set of problems. Well, this was, uh, I must say, a pretty long and very interesting and very fascinating session where we covered a whole range of things. So, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have been part of this. Have a good day. Thank you.